That was really beautiful. Thank you for that. Open your Bible tonight, please. to The Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Now, I'd like to invite you to stand if you, if you can. Stand. And we'll read together just a few verses, beginning at verse 30. Luke, chapter 24. This is after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a couple of the disciples were going to go to a town called Emmaus. And that's in verse 13. Now, it says here from Jerusalem, it's about three score furlongs. That's just less than seven miles. So by foot, it would have taken two to two and a half hours. Emmaus is a sort of northwest of Jerusalem. And while they were walking along there, you know, the Lord Jesus came and joined up with them. And so the conversation ensued and they finally got to where they were going and they begged him to stay. Um, that's in verse 29 because the day was far spent. And so we pick up in verse 30, and let's read from verse 30 to verse 35 together, shall we? Let's begin. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Let's pray. Our Father, help us tonight to learn a little more about our Savior and having fellowship, sweet fellowship with him, please we ask that you would protect our hearts and minds tonight. Don't let the devil take our minds off what we're talking about and the table of the Lord and fellowship and communion with our Savior. Help us to stay focused tonight. Please we pray you would receive from our hearts love and worship and praise and obedience and prepare us, Lord for your table. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. You know, having someone over for dinner is a great way to get to know them. And it's an opportunity that you should, uh, you and I should take more advantage of. Um, going out for a meal with someone or having them into your home or going over into their home and being with them and spending a little time. And it's just a nice opportunity just to kind of get to know you a bit better. And we have these uh, two disciples. They weren't the apostles. They were just two saved men. And they were followers of Jesus. Um, boy, there was huge stirring in Jerusalem with the, the crucifixion of Christ. And a few days later, people are still buzzing about it. And then these two went up to Emmaus and... Um, and along the way, the Lord Jesus joined himself with them, but they didn't know it was him. And so they said, please stay with us. The day is far spent. It was sort of a customary thing to do. You didn't want to leave a, a stranger out on the street. And so he came in and they sat down at the dinner table. And um, here in verse uh, 35, it says, and they, they told what things were done in the way. And how, now watch this how he was known of them in breaking of bread. I want to suggest to you that we will know Jesus better through the communion table. There's a blessing in the table of the Lord that's not to be found anywhere else. I know that there are religious groups, parachurch organizations, and different, different ones that take the communion table and try and take it out on the internet. They take it and they try to 
turn it into a production. They change the elements. Instead of using the grape juice, they'll use Coca-Cola or Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, or something like that. They'll substitute the bread for Tim Horton donuts or some such nonsense. And they, they think they're, they're modernizing. They think they're adding. They're not. They're subtracting. And it's a shame uh, what's being done. I saw this past week... Uh, Maybe you've heard of um, this group in Australia. They've gone around the world. It's named Hillsong. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you have. Very popular all around the world. They've got different chapters of Hillsong around the world. Well, this one chapter in Europe, now I, I imagine they're doing it elsewhere, but the news was focused on this one Hillsong chapter. And uh, they always use the, the guitars and drums, of course. Well, they really got screaming and squealing on their guitars. And to show some kind of homage and honor to the Lord, they took their guitars and smashed them on stage. No different than the wicked, wicked worldly rock stars. And what's happening there, it's, uh, it's really sad. But their point, they started off pointing in the wrong direction and just given enough time and they'll end up over the cliff. And I'm afraid that's what's happened with Hillsong. And some churches are so into it, they can't turn back. There's no turning back. Praise the Lord, we never were part of it. And we never will be as long as I can help it. But getting back here to the communion service, it's a very special, precious time. And I'm so glad you're here tonight. I would far, far rather be here in the Lord's house with the table of the Lord than, uh, I don't know, say in uh, Florida watching, you know, front row seats or something on the uh, Super Bowl game or something like that. A few years ago, there was a Lutheran church pastored by a young man in his mid to late 30s, I think. And he had on his Lutheran gown and everything. And he stood up to his congregation. It's on YouTube. And he said, well, folks, he says, as you know, today is Super Bowl. He said, on the table behind me is some bread. You're welcome to come and take it. There's some wine over here. You're welcome to help yourself. But as for me, I'm out of here. And he pulled his robe and he had his favorite football team jersey on. And he took off out the church to go home and watch the Super Bowl. Can you imagine? Huh? Imagine if they had Super Bowl back in Jesus' day while he was being crucified. It makes you think. How many would have gone to the Super Bowl rather than to, to, the, uh, to the cross? Well, we'll never know the answer to that. But something's very interesting here. In verse 30, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them. Doesn't that sound like something? Here he was in their home and they were having a meal. And his mannerisms here reminded them of maybe chapter 22, if you look there. Chapter 22. Verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And maybe, just maybe, somehow, there was some click there because it sure seems similar, doesn't it? You know, as I mentioned a dinner meal is a wonderful way to get to know people. If you look in the book of Revelation, I'll show you another dinner meal. Revelation chapter number three. Revelation chapter number three. It's found at the end of the seventh letter to the seventh church, Laodicea. 
Verse 20, the Lord Jesus writes, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. Now stop there for a moment. There's a picture of Christ being on the outside, knocking, seeking admission to the inside. And it's just a very typical picture we're all familiar with. Whenever you go over to anyone's home, you knock or ring the doorbell or something like that. And that alerts the homeowner and then they come to the door and they know it's you. So they open the door and in you come. Our Lord Jesus is pictured here in a church setting, if you will, but yet with individuals. Because it's it's done not as a corporate, but as an individual. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. You get the idea individual that's why no one is ever going to get to to heaven just by attending church no one will ever get to heaven just by going to church or by taking communion or getting baptized because that's not it 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 has to be the lord jesus that gets us to church to get us to heaven i'm sorry and so that happens when we receive christ as savior and the bible does say that christ needs to be rooted and grounded by faith in our hearts And this is why we talk about receiving Christ into our hearts. Um, But once he comes in, you'll notice it goes on in the end of verse 20, and we'll sup with him. That's the idea of a supper meal, and he with me. Now here's a wonderful way in which to get to know the Lord Jesus, of course, is to invite him in to be Savior, right? Do you remember the day you invited Jesus into your heart to be saved? You remember that? Can you remember the day? This morning we had... Glenn become a senior member. So now he's an old man member, right? He's a senior, senior old man, Glenn. He's a senior member and allowed to vote too. That's dangerous, but we trust him. And so um, he told us in his testimony when he got saved, the very day he got saved in 2013. Now, some Christians don't know the very day that they got saved. After I was saved, I forgot what day it was. I knew I was saved, but I didn't know when. And so I became quite concerned about that, and I felt I need to know. So I went to the Lord in prayer, and I prayed, and I begged God to show me. And as I thought and meditated, and I think it was over a period of a couple of weeks that I was praying and earnestly praying, the Lord sort of brought to my memory and opened the eyes of my understanding, and I recalled, oh, of course. April the 6th, 1975, in the ballroom of the airport Holiday Inn in Montreal. It was about 12 noon. Now I went forward on the invitation and I couldn't get to the front. I got halfway up the aisle because it was crowded. I got on my knees and that's when I got saved. And I remember jumping to my feet. Oh, happy day. Revelation 3.20, I will come into him. And we'll sup with him. And it's like having a wonderful meal with the Lord. And this also pictures for us the communion table, doesn't it? Let me show you another one while we're in Revelation. Let's go to chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And here we start in verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Here's a marriage supper. And his wife hath made herself ready. I believe this to be referring to the salvation of Israel. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This also is an indication of salvation and righteousness, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow, there's a a marriage supper. There's a supper uh, event right there. Again, we're just making an analogy. 
that when you sit down with someone for a meal, it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know them. That's what we're saying. And the table of the Lord is something like that. And we'll now go back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. And we'll take a quick look at it. This is probably the best single chapter we have on the teaching of the table of the Lord. And we'll just briefly pick it up in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. If you've been coming to this church for any length of time, you'll know that uh, once a month we celebrate the table of the Lord. And it's uh, usually an evening event, but um, once every three months we put it at the end of the morning service for the benefit of those who are not able to come in the evening service. Uh, Back uh, a chapter or two in chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. Here we have mention of it actually again. Verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? This idea of communion is spiritual union together. It's a a sharing together, a fellowship we have. It's meant for saved people. It's not meant for unsaved because unsaved people, if they were to die right now, they, they would not go to heaven. They would have to go to hell and begin for all eternity paying on their sins. They're not born again. The blood of Christ has never been applied to their lives. They've never repented of their sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus to be saved. They're unsaved. And so they have no part in the table of the Lord. And we try to make that as clear as we can. Every time we have the table of the Lord. We do not police the table. We do not say, okay, line up. You can, you can't. You get out of line. You get in line. We don't do things like that. We give you the option. Obviously, if uh, parents have smaller children, they need to make the decision for the children. If they know for sure the children are saved, then the children can partake. If they know or they're not sure if the children are saved, they should just let it go by. Um, this, the Lord Jesus gave us, and it, it is evident right, right from get the get go. If you look at Acts chapter two, on the very day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish feast and chapter two, uh, Peter preaches this marvelous sermon, 3000 people get saved that day. And so here's what happened here uh, in verse 41, after they they all got baptized and joined the church. uh, Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread. Uh, I don't believe that these are potluck suppers, the breaking of bread spoken of here. Because look at the, the other three things. This is like, in in a sandwich, if you will. Doctrine, it's a spiritual thing, belongs to the the church. Fellowship, likewise, and prayers. And in between it is the breaking of bread. That's communion. This is not potluck suppers because anyone can do potluck suppers. But the new converts, the 3,000, the brand new ones, they were hungry for spiritual things. And so they continued steadfastly in these things. And one of them they continued steadfastly in was the uh, communion table, the breaking of bread. And so getting back to what we originally said in Luke 24, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they found a deeper relationship with the Lord at a meal table similar to a communion table. We too, you and I, 
and we find deeper fellowship with the Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ at the communion table. Now, what we need to do is we need to talk to the Lord first. Before we get involved with the, the uh, bread and with the, the juice, before we do any of that, we need to just pull the bus over and park it for a minute and take time and ask the Lord, Lord, I need you to search my heart. I need you to see if there's anything in there that shouldn't be there. Lord, have I said some unkind words to people? Have I taken something and not returned it? Have I made a promise and broken it? Have I been unkind to someone? Have I been worldly? Have I put my hand in the cookie jar and of this world and taken things and I shouldn't have? Have I broken promises to you, Lord? Have I been not spending time with you in the prayer closet? Remember that the sin is two ways of sinning. There's there's the actual commission of sin where you do something you shouldn't do. And then there's the holding back of doing what you should do. And we should spend time with the Lord Jesus. Have a sweetheart time with Jesus every day. Whether you do it morning and evening or just morning or just evening. But at least once a day. Read your Bible and pray. Get on your face and pray. We should be a faithful at church. Faithful in giving. Faithful in serving. And these are things we should do. And the devil tries to keep us back from doing them. And then there are things we shouldn't do. And these are things the devil tries to push us into doing. So sin is like a two, two-way street or two, two sides of the coin or something. And so we need to bow our heads now and ask the Lord to show us if there's anything that's not right. And we need to ask the Lord's forgiveness if it involves an action, if you involves a person or, or something you've done, you need to promise the Lord you're going to fix that. No sense in asking the Lord to forgive you if you're not willing to make something right. You have to be willing to make things right. But God will bless you for it. So let's close our eyes now and bow our heads.